Hello and welcome to She Conquers Capital. I'm your host, Stephanie Diaz, podcaster, founder, community builder, and partner at Zane Venture Fund. And She Conquers Capital is your place for powerful conversations with the women and allies impacting the flow of capital. And with that said, I'm so excited to welcome today's guest, Catherine Wurtzman from Amplify Capital. Um, joining us from Toronto today, Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So pleased to be here. Yes. And as I said, you are joining us from Canada. Uh, why don't you give it, were you born there? Are you from there? Is that I your- I was born in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, um, and lived here most of my life. Although mm -hmm. I did go to Columbia Business School in New York. So okay. uh, I decided to stay in New York for about four years after that. I did a brief stint in Telluride, Colorado before moving back to Toronto. It really is a great place to live. Um, really high quality standard of living and Canada's looking pretty good right now globally. So yeah, we're pretty happy to be here. Beautiful. Well, I love that this show is going international. I'm in Atlanta Tuesday. I had an interview with someone from Dubai, now awesome. you. So let's bring it all together. We're really excited. Um, why don't you share a little bit about yourself and Amplify? Sure. Thanks. Um, so I uh, grew up in, in Toronto. Uh, my background really started in investment banking. It was a short stint, only a couple of years, but I was part of the team that took the first internet company public in Canada. So that was really exciting and pretty revolutionary at the time where I had to convince um, the elder partners at the time that the internet was a real market and a real, you know, there was real business potential there. And, and in fact, had to negotiate with the Securities Commission to validate that as well before we took the company public. And during that um, process, I learned about venture capital because it was a VC-backed company mm -hmm. uh, that we were taking public. And in the 90s, uh, VC wasn't the common household word that it is today. So hopped over to VC once I learned about that and really loved um, on being on the investment side, You know, working with companies to help them grow first financially and then ultimately helping them more operationally um, and then as I made my way to New York um, and started working in New York, I joined a group called Social Venture Partners, which is venture philanthropy. So think of venture capital, but instead of investing, you give it away, um, but you act like a VC. Okay. Um, you act like a VC, sit on their board, help with governance, sit on the nonprofit's board, help with governance, marketing, um, hiring, uh, et cetera. And I, you know, as a recent business grad, I was really keen to use my business skills and helping um, community and social outcomes. So, I, you know, the whole business tied to good started mm -hmm. to form. Um, and then when I made my way back to Toronto, I started the chapter here in Toronto. So I started Social Ventures Partners, so, so, sorry, Social Venture Partners Toronto um, back in 2006. And uh, for a good six years, I was venture capitalist by day and venture philanthropist by night. And then it was about 2015 where I learned about impact investing. And I thought, wow, this is perfect because now I have a family and I can't mm -hmm. do this extracurricular uh, work anymore. And this is great for me to combine my passion for doing good with my very passionate you know, skill set for investing. Because right. I, I really do love uh, investing in, in companies. And so impact investing was a clear fit. So at that time I walked up and down Bay street, which is our equivalent wall street, talked to everybody about, you know, ESG and, 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 um, sustainability and the UNPRI and sustainable development goals. And I got a lot of, you know, cross-eyed looks, right? So no one was ready at the time. They said, this sounds great, but no one's buying it. No one's paying for this work right, right now. And I spoke to some very senior people at pension funds, private equity funds, wealth managers, um, asset managers, et cetera. And you know, everyone wanted the conversation, but no one was willing to really make an investment in resources to really understand it. And so when I came across Mars Discovery District that had a center for impact investing and that was doing something, it was, it was really a perfect fit. So in 2016, uh, Mars Catalyst Fund was born, which is Amplify Capital Fund One, mm -hmm. essentially, and and we launched the fund. So maybe I'll stop there. 
Yeah, you said something that I think a lot of us can relate to. You were like, everyone was interested. Like they see it, they love the concept, but when it comes to the dollars, you know, starting to flow, um, you felt it with impact investing. So many have, I know when it comes to diversity, there are a lot of fund managers, everyone loves the conversation, you know, but let's, how do we really bring the capital to the table? Um, any advice for being in that position? Um, to, so the position of trying to convince others. Of realizing, like knowing that there's a lot of heart, you know, a lot of people see the vision, you're in the right place. Um, you, you're being authentic to your purpose as you shared in some of your notes, you know, when you were scheduling the call. Yes. Um, but, you know, but, but sometimes you're just not quite getting the traction and the momentum that you would right. anticipate with such an active conversation. Right. I think the answer to that is really understanding what the other side needs. And having come from the institutional investor background, I knew what they needed. They needed to see proof. Mm -hmm. And so I just put my head down and, and built the track record. And that is where we are today. It took five years to build the track record. Um, but now we have it. And from so fun one now, to fun two, from one to, from mm -hmm. fun one to fun two. So we had to get those early believers and almost to try to convince a group of investors that maybe didn't believe that the financial return was there, but were willing to take a chance. Yeah. So maybe they invested out of their foundation mm -hmm. or their extra capital on the side because mm -hmm. they knew, you know, even if, even if the, the money went to zero, they were, they were building, they were building something. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it was a, it was a fine line to walk back then because I wanted to convey that message to say, look, even if this, even if your investment goes to zero, you're building the impact investment sector because we have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. But at the same time, I'd say, but it's not going to go to zero because, you know, we've got all these great companies. I'm a well-trained, well, -trained, well -trained, your background, you know, yeah. investor. I know what I'm doing and, you know, we're sitting in the middle of, you know, an ecosystem that can deliver us amazing opportunities. So, mm -hmm. but, 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 you know, there was that bridge to cross. And so we, we, we were able to do it with a very small and also very small uh, pool of capital. So we only raised $6 million Canadian, which is like four and a half us. Mm -hmm. So, so just start with a little, and that was really, really important. So even mm -hmm. when we did our first close at 3 million, we just started investing to show the traction um, and then have people speak on our behalf. So the best way to market, I find the best way to market and fundraise is for other people to tell you know, investors what the experience has been and, and the benefit to um, the ecosystem and to their, to their pocketbook has been. Mm hmm. On on the same lines, let's let's kind of keep in that vein and talk about emerging fund managers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are a lot of resources and a lot of activity, you know, around supporting that group. What have you found that's been really helpful for emerging fund managers? I have not found the resources supporting <laughs> emerging fund managers. I'm like, oh, thinking, I where like are they? <laughs> well, resources might not be the right word. Um, there, but I do feel like there's a lot of conversation, um, you know, a lot of groups that are being activated that focus on the emerging fund manager. And so from that perspective, um, it's its own community that rallies together. Um, yeah. But maybe yeah. talk, talk more about your experience. Well, it's been, you know, as an emerging fund manager, it was, I'll say, very easy to get in on the deal side. So, so I have kind of, um, so on one hand, I'm, get, you know, I'm investing in money, but I'm also fundraising, right? On the investing side, I found it very easy to, to come into the market, um, participate with other investors and, and get in on, on oppor investment opportunities. So as an emerging fund manager, I actually found that really easy. Um, but on the fundraising side, it was it was definitely harder. The Canadians are notoriously conservative. They like to invest in what they know. They like to invest in a solid track record. And so the big institutional names, you know, would, all, would say, come back to me on a fund three sort of thing. And so it really was, um, you know, convincing uh, others that emerging fund managers, uh, you know, it's, it's worth the bet 
on emerging fund managers. I mean, there's data out there, as you know, but um, it was uh, it, here in Canada, the, the foundations are smaller. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really about, and, and they just don't want to take, it's hard for them to take the risk. Um, and so we get a lot of pushback now, even because some of the larger institutions want to invest in a hundred million dollar funds. Um, yeah. they want the, to write the big checks and even at a $30 million size fund, it's, it's tough for them. So, so your fund too is 30 million. That's right. Okay. So our fund too is 30 million. Um, so even at 30 million, it's, it's tough. So that it's, it's been a little difficult. And then I find, you know, we're trying to get in on all the conversations, especially now, you know, as, as fund managers or as, um, larger investors are trying to. Then yesterday I had a call with an institution and they said, you know, we've invested three times sorry, did I lose you? Three times the amount of funds in the last nine months than we have in the last three years. And I'm thinking, why wasn't I part of the conversation? Mm -hmm. I've been, you know, I've been following up with you, you know, for months. And so- What was their you know, response? Uh, I didn't say that. You didn't actually say that? Okay. <laughs> I didn't actually say that. But that's what I was thinking. Yeah. And, you know, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's a delicate, it's a delicate balance. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about social impact investing and, and the returns, you know, um, when it comes to not seeing this money as philanthropic dollars, but seeing it as a meaningful place, you know, to put capital and, and knowing that it can yield a return. Right. Well, in 2016, when we started investing in clean tech, other investors looked at us and said, no money there, no returns there, don't go there, right? And we invested in an early stage company that was just proving out their technology, their energy storage technology called HydroStore. And um, we made a bet. And, you know, four years later, six, I think we've participated in six rounds, all of which have been up. Um, the company's proving out the model that, um, and the thesis, frankly, that we're going to need long-term, long-duration, low-cost uh, energy storage if we're going to live in a 100% renewable energy future. So we need a solution for when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. And so HydroStore has been an, a phenomenal uh, story for us. Um, and we've been able to book on paper some good returns. And then another example is mental health. We invested in mental health before COVID and we led that deal. And frankly, as a small fund, we, we were trying to get another VC in on that deal. The other investors that came in on that deal were a family office and mm -hmm. another impact investor. Um, the traditional VCs didn't want to look at it. They didn't understand the business model for online mental health therapy. Well, today you're saying, well, of course, right? But, mm -hmm. but you know, back then it was, it was a little far for them. And then, but if you look at the business metrics of, of um, helping, you know, providing a, a product that people are willing to pay for, but can't leave their desk between nine and five and the 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 office is you know a, a taxi ride or a subway away and when they walk in that office it's a minimum a hundred to two hundred dollar visit it is you know it's there's lots of costs beyond that actual financial cost and by putting it online you save time and money because they visit as much less in addition the matching algorithms through machine learning mm -hmm. allow for a much better fit between patient and therapist versus, you know, if you were to recommend me your therapist, it may be great for you, but that person mm -hmm. might not be a great fit for me True. for, for lots of different reasons. So those two things alone help propel the business, you know, COVID or not, but, you know, through COVID, the business has, um, has gone up. Sales have increased 10 times over the last year, last year. Wow. So, so we have, you know, a number of stories like that in our portfolio that show, you know, you invest in solid business models 
that are solving an urgent need with multiple stakeholders, meaning, you know, retail consumers like you and I, governments, right? And then businesses, then you have, you know, the recipe for a good financial return. And you put on any capitalist, you know, finance hat, you're going to make that, um, you're going to make that math work all day long. Well, I mean, you know, to your point at, at the end of the day, you're solving a problem, you know, okay. and there's value for the solution that this company is bringing. And just because it's in a certain industry that hasn't necessarily, you know, been top of mind, doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile and, and ready to, to expand in, in a big way. You know what, Stephanie, you just picked up on something that's really relevant. We focus on solving problems. And so we dig in on that in our diligence and we, we wanna see kind of early validation on the technology and product market fit, but we actually know that the tech and the product will shift over time. As the company gets clearer on the problem they are solving and how to solve it, the product starts to tweak. Mm -hmm. And we've seen it over and over again, but the team is relentless in solving the problem. And as they understand it better, get into market, converse with customers, they, they, they figure out how to better solve the problem. And the, the teams that we invest in are really double bottom line motivated because they're out to solve the problem, but they know they can't solve it without generating profits to fund you know, that problem solving product um, and expanding that. I love it. And it takes me back. So on the, um, on the form to, to book your interview, um, I asked for, you know, what's your biggest piece of advice? And do you remember what you said? No. No. <laughs> and um, don't worry, because I'm sure most don't. Uh, you said be authentic and purpose driven. And yeah. I think that speaks to exactly what you said. Um, you know, the best founders are the ones who are relentless in their pursuit of solving the problem. And passion and purpose have a lot to do with that. So obviously a winning combination. I think so. Good. So what, um, what do you see? You all are in the midst of raising fund two, as you shared. Um, what does the rest of 2021 um, hold for you all? Well, um, it's our goal that we finish fundraising. That would be nice. And then we're actively investing. We're seeing quite a bit of activity in clean technologies that are scalable. So one of the things that shifted over the last five years is clean tech solutions have become much more capital efficient. So no more demonstration plants or big, you know, operations to prove out if the technology works. There's lots of innovations around sensor technology or just, you know, um, more lightweight uh, technology that can help curb use, monitor it, um, even capture it with material science. I'm getting super excited about some of the materials that are plant-based and organic and renewable uh, mm -hmm. to solve some of our clean tech solutions. And then education seeing a big push. We're seeing Huge. some really interesting things in education. We just invested in an early literacy screen uh, company out of Boston called Early Bird. Super excited about that one. And it's really interesting because it's a confluence of the massive need for uh, early literacy screening um, for for JK to grade two and making sure kids get on the right track if they struggle with reading um, with uh, the regulations coming in saying 26 out of uh, 26 states now regulate that students need this screener to ensure that they are on the right track. So it's, it's a nice uh, combination of um, opportunity for us. And then in healthcare, I mean, I don't need to tell you that health tech is exploding. Mm -hmm. um, lucky for us, we know what to look for. So we've been investing in health tech for the last five years. Exactly. We know the questions to ask. We know where the opportunities are. And really, there's a couple of things. One is democratization of best in class healthcare. I like to say, you know, you, we've all experienced, um, you know, you have to go see Dr. Lax at Mount Sinai. I'll give you his number. We want to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. Everyone should have accessibility to the best doctor. And really, we're looking to deliver that through technology. Um, we're looking at, obviously, some remote therapy solutions. But really, if you think about the hospital and the way healthcare is delivered today, the future is going to be more in the community. So some of that will be in the home. 
Some of that will be localized in, you know, local clinics, but really we're going to see that disbursement out of the hospital and more care is going to be delivered directly to you, closer to you. It's cheaper and more effective for everybody. And then if, if you think about tracking and vaccine tracking and testing and all that, that's not going away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of competition there. So, you know, it's about, you know, looking at where to play, where to play in that space. Um, one last question on that competition piece, you know, when you see sometimes, you know, these concepts come forward and you see several, several startups are attacking a similar problem, sometimes in, in slightly nuanced, unique ways, but sometimes not. Um, what have you found in terms of starting to, you know, to understand um, who may emerge victorious from that competition? So yeah, it's really, you know, it's, it's complex. I'll give you a couple of stories course, that will yeah. make you laugh. So lots of stories that we've seen with COVID to say, you know, they had it, they were testing for some blood variant or saliva, you know, a variant in the saliva and they say, oh, you know, now we'll, we'll reconfigure our test for COVID, right? So we see a lot of that and, and we, you know, those are tough because we really like to back uh, teams that, you know, are passionate about the problem that they're solving versus, you know, pivoting from one thing to the next. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have to be careful with that and make sure that they're aligned with the mission. So, so we've seen a lot of that. Um, but the winner in, in some of this testing and tracking, it's a combination of um, companies that have already built the technology so that it works. Um, versus, you know, ones that just came to the game, you know, to, to solve for COVID, like it's complicated. And if you didn't have a platform that could be adopted to COVID, um, or that was kind of on the, you know, how do we track, how do we track patient info, um, legitimately, securely, um, seamlessly, uh, across multiple platforms, hospitals, individuals, governments, workplaces, et cetera. If you weren't already on that path, then yeah. it's very hard to, to get up there. But the bigger challenge is dealing with governments. And, you know, I know they're trying really hard, but the healthcare as the healthcare industry is very bureaucratic and they have their seven players that they like to, to work with, the large technology players. So it doesn't, it, it sometimes has been blocking out the early stage startups that have mm -hmm. the solution but they don't have the big corporate brand name attached to them yet. So I'm, I'm hoping we start to see a little bit more leniency from governments to support some of these startups that actually can solve the problem. Because what's happening is, is hospitals who are in the middle want to go with the startup solution or they'll say the early stage company solution because it works and kind of push aside what the government's pushing on them. So that doesn't work. Right. But then there, mm -hmm. like, there's all this kind of processes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so government has to kind of get out of the way a little bit. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, you know, they're, they've got lots of stakeholders that will say, you know, why did you choose company ABC? They're, you know, two years in business. They only have a million dollars in the bank. How can you trust them with this $10 million contract? Right. Like there's, mm -hmm. There's lots of considerations um, and, and it's very, it's hard. It's really hard. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's really having the balance and unfortunately it comes back down to the networks. So no matter, you know, who you are, you need to, um, you need to have that network. And then even some of our superstar companies, they're quiet behind the scenes, you know, just ready to announce you know, some big changes and they need help with how do they market? How do they get their story out? Who do they talk to? Because they need, they're now ready for the attention that they deserve. So working for. yeah, yeah. So competition is, is multifaceted. To say the least. <laughs> and thank you for that. I actually, my first uh, startup experience was in pharma and definitely spent some time trying to get products into hospital systems and understand those RFP processes and everything. So um, I don't miss that world though. <laughs> I'm very happy here. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, if you want to connect with Catherine, um, you can 
check out Amplify Capital um, or follow her, Catherine Wartzman on Twitter, LinkedIn. I know I'll link to all of your places here. Um, thank you so much and we'll catch you next time. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. Have a great day.